Every great movement must experience three stages, ridicule, discussion, and adoption. That first cell phone was ridiculous. Who on earth is going to buy that thing? $4,000 for a brick that hardly does anything. The future of water, which is closer and better than you think, is that we're going we're gonna to mitigate a lot of the current environmental, ecological, and social challenges with water by harvesting water straight from the sky at individual properties and then recycling it forever. All right, welcome to another episode of Liquid Assets, where we talk about the business of water. Liquid Assets is a podcast about the intersection of business, technology, and policy, all looking at the lens of water. Today, we have an amazing guest for you. We have Professor Jeffrey Langholtz from the Monterey Institute. My name is Jeff Langholtz. I'm a professor of natural resource policy and management in Monterey, California. I work on sustainable management of fisheries, forests, wildlife, and water around the world. And without further ado, Professor Langholtz, I'll let you actually do a quick introduction of yourself. Who are you? Where do you live? What do you do? Go for it. All right. Thanks, Ravi. It's great to be here on your pod. And my name is Jeff Langholtz. I'm a professor in Monterey, California at a place called the Middlebury Institute of International Studies, formerly the Monterey Institute of International Studies. And I've been there for 23 years now, and I focus on natural resources, policy and management issues surrounding fisheries, forests, wildlife, and water, and other resources around the world. And for over two decades now, I've been working on the sustainable management of these resources in Africa, Asia, Latin America, Europe, and North America. And more recently, I've really been leaning towards water especially because here in the Western United States, water has become such an important issue. And it's not just in the United States, it's around the world. So many regions are having such issues with water. And when you look at the maps of projected water scarcity around the world through, let's say, 2040, a popular map that the World Resources Institute puts out, you can see how many countries are are going to be experiencing severe water stress in the not-so-distant future. So I've been looking for solutions to the water crisis, and I've come up with a few ideas on this after doing a, pardon the pun, a deep dive. And so I put together a talk several years ago called The Future of Water is Closer and Better Than You Think. And people laugh when I, go, and I, I started giving this talk, and for good or bad, people liked it, and they encouraged me. And so I did it again and again. I did it at Stanford University, for example, in the course called the business of water. 42 student grad students from the law school and the, the graduate school of business who were getting their MBAs and the engineering school. And I did it at the Pebble Beach Authors and Idea Festival with 500 movers and shakers in the audience. And each time I do this, I take a pretest. I say, how many of you agree with this title on the screen here that the future of water is closer and better than you think? And everybody laughs at me and nobody raises their hand. Maybe one or two people raise their hands. And then I do my speech, my shtick, and at the end, I show the title again, The Future of Water is Closer and Better Than You Think. How many of you agree with this now? And all the hands shoot up, whether it's 50 people at Stanford, 80 at Cornell, 500 in Pebble Beach, everybody, except a few holdouts who I need a little more time with, everybody tends to agree with it. So I thought I'd I appreciate the opportunity today to come on the podcast and talk about this preposterous idea that the future of water might just be closer and better than you think. That's awesome, Professor Langholz. Yeah, let's go ahead and dig right in. What do you say in this presentation that gets people to raise their hands towards the end of the presentation? Like, how do you convince them outside of the of the few scragglers? And a question for you at the end, how do you convince those guys actually that, that haven't raised their hand? I take them through a process. First of all, I talk about our current state of water and why our current approach to water is so unsustainable, why it's really showing strains. And to do this, I go through the standard three pillars of sustainability. In order for any anything to be sustainable in this world, it's got to cover the trifecta. It's got to cover the three Ps. It has to be good for people, planet, and prosperity. Now, some experts prefer, instead of the three Ps of sustainability, they like the three E's. For something to be sustainable, it's got to be good for equity, ecology, and economics. And still, other experts prefer the three C's of sustainability. It's got to be good for communities, commerce, and conservation. I don't care what letters of the alphabet you use, A, B, C, P, D, Q, X, Y, Z. To be sustainable, it's got to cover all three bases. 
And when then I walk through the three P's of sustainability or the three pillars of sustainability with respect to our current water, I talk about people first and I show water scarcity and people struggling to meet their basic needs for water. I talk about water affordability, how prices are going up. I talk about pollution of water, degradation of surface water and groundwater. I talk about a variety of problems with water, how the how water rates are rising faster than any other utility price over the last decade, faster than any other, your inflation, your electricity, and other things. So I walk them, I, we come to the idea that water is not so good for people. Our current approach has challenges. And then we look at the planet. How sustainable is water with respect to environmental implications? And we talk about our how our current approach which is this centralized distribution model that requires pumping water up and over mountains, pumping water through deserts, for example, hundreds of kilometers from the mountains of California to Los Angeles or to San Francisco. All the energy costs and the habitat destruction and the ecological footprint that requires. And things like desalinization plants are even worse with all the energy requirements for de- and the effluents that come out. And so our current approach The centralized distributed system, centralized model is not very good for the planet either. And then for prosperity, the third P, we talk about, is this system sustainable in that regard? And it's pretty clear it has serious issues on the prosperity side. Once again, our system, our centralized distribution model that we currently have is showing signs of strain. We depend on these underground pumps that have been in play that are reaching the end of their useful life. Of the water mains in Los Angeles and San Francisco and so many cities in Europe and the United States are reaching the end of their useful life. A lot of them are several decades old and they're rusting through. And every now and then you see in the newspaper what looks like a geyser popping up in the middle of a street, in, say in Los Angeles. It's not a geyser like Yellowstone. It's actually a, another leak in a water main pipe that rusted through. And it's actually good news when we see those geysers, the water main bursts and the water shoots up into the sky because we know the leak is there. Most of the time, the leaks are not conveniently on the top of the pipe. They're going sideways or downward, and we're losing so much of that water. By some estimates, 30 to 40 percent of our potable water dripping into the ground unseen. So the price tag to upgrade this incredible system of, pu- of pipes is on the, in the neighborhood of a trillion dollars just in the United States. And what do you think? Okay, a trillion dollars. Who's going to pick up the tab for that? That's a big price. And unfortunately, the same people who usually pick up the tab for these things are going to pick it up again. And that'll be the people who Mm -hmm. pay for water. And as a result, the prices continue to go up. Oh, people are getting mad. You can see the protests in the United States about water bills tripling, people marching in the streets, protests. You can see the footage in Peru. People are protesting in Bolivia, in Ireland, and India. Countries around the world, people are protesting the skyrocketing rise in water rates. It's become such a massive issue. And there are a lot more issues with this, with water, in these three P's of sustainability. It's not so good for people, planet, or prosperity. And what we're seeing is people are even using water, once again, as a weapon of war. The Ukraine, mm-hmm. the war in Ukraine, for example. One of the oldest military tactics in the book is to use water as a weapon of war. Thanks to these centralized distribution models with hydroelectric dams that displace communities and cause other ecological harm, you can blow up a dam and release water that slows down your enemy's advance. We're also seeing water more recently, recently again, as a tool for terrorists. If you poison a city's water supply by introducing a chemical or a bacterial biological agent, thanks to the pumps and pipes and the centralized distribution system, you can affect thousands or millions of people. So we have the bottom line is we have a lot of issues with our current approach to water. It's not so good across the trifecta of sustainability, people, planet, and prosperity. We can do better. And so I wasn't really focused on this too much. I was working on other priorities. And then I something happened that, that caused me to jump into this and decide I've got to jump into this topic. And what happened was I saw in our local newspaper one day in Monterey, California, I picked up, I saw the headline about an elderly couple in their 90s who just got a water bill from our local water company for 5200 and some dollars. And they couldn't afford oh, this water bill. 
And I'm like, wait, this isn't, I read the article, this is an elderly couple in their 90s. He's a World War II veteran, served his country, fought in Europe, they're on a fixed income, and they just got a $5,000 water bill. And something inside me switched. There was an invisible flip, an invisible switch flipped. And I'm like, that's it. I'm in. I'm going to see if we can do something about this. And that started a quest into the future of water. How can we figure out a solution to this mess? And I started looking, checking. Hey, first thing was, let's come at this from an abundance perspective. Where can we find some untapped water? Surely there's some water sitting around somewhere we can use. So I checked the usual places. I looked at snowpack, but it's getting less and less. I looked at groundwater, but the aquifers are getting overdrawn and polluted. I looked at rivers and lakes and streams, but they're drying up around the world. I looked at desal, but I ruled that out because of the reasons I already mentioned about the energy costs and the effluence. And I checked all over the place. At about this time, we found that there's probably water on Mars. And I thought, okay, water on Mars. And then I did the math and I'm like, no, that's not going to work. Not going to work at all. I even, Ravi, I even looked at towing icebergs from the Arctic, you know, that old standby. We'll get some icebergs. We'll tow them to California. Not going to work. Not good for the three P's of sustainability, people, planet, or prosperity. So I thought, okay, where can we find a new source for water? Uh, what's out there? Mm -hmm. And I looked and I finally found it. I found what I think is this vast untapped source of water. And I guess what is that? I would say it's in the it's in the air around us. It's in the moisture. Exactly. The vast untapped reservoir of water for humanity is the sky above us. It is an invisible ocean of water. Sometimes it's not quite invisible. You see the puffy white clouds or you see the rain clouds going by. It is a massive source of water. And people, it's time we start thinking of it that way. And the best thing about this massive untapped source of water, sky water, is that it's available to all people on earth, regardless where they live, how poor they are, it's a, or rich. It's available at all times, 24-7, not just when the water utility decides you get water or rations it. And it's available, it's available all places, all times for all people. So I started looking into sky water and that started a, an incredible journey an incredible investigation into what's going on with this. And as the more I looked into it, the more excited I became about the potential for this. And the more I looked into this, the more, I guess, a vision for the future of water started to come into focus. And that vision really has four parts. My vision for the future of water is that we mitigate the current environmental, ecological, and economic problems with water by harvesting water straight from the sky and then recycling it forever. And that sounds like an interesting pie in the sky vision that we're going to start harvesting water straight from the sky at individual properties around the world and then reuse it forever at those properties. But how can we make that a reality? And so I've come up with a specific model that grounds this vision literally at individual properties around the world. Okay. And it entails four parts. First, mm -hmm. we harvest water from the sky passively through fog harvesting, dew harvesting, and rainwater harvesting. And then where appropriate, we also harvest water actively using energy through these things called atmospheric water generators. So that's the first two parts of the four steps, the model. You harvest water from the sky passively and then actively using these technologies. And then the other two parts of the circle, once you have the water at your property, whether it's an individual property, a residence or a build commercial building, or even a neighborhood scale like so neighborhood solar, you can do neighborhood wa atmospheric water, then you recycle it. You use gray water recycling or and or black water recycling and use those same gallons over and over again. So this is the vision for the future of water, a future of water that is good for people, planet, and prosperity, that helps mitigate the current environmental, economic, and social issues surrounding our current centralized approach. This is a new distribu distributed, decentralized model for water. And when I think about this, I think, wait a minute, I've seen this movie before. Two of my utility bills, my monthly utilities that I pay for, like electricity and my phone service, they've already gone through this transition. When I was young, 
Yeah. I used to get my phone service, telecommunications, through something called telephone wires. There was this centralized grid of telephone wires, and that's how I got my phone. And now I get my, with a cell phone, I get my telephone service invisibly from the sky. The same thing happened with electricity. I used to get my electricity from a big power plant here in California through this centralized grid, the electrical grid, with all the problems that come with that during power brownouts and blackouts. And now, thanks to the solar panels on my roof, where do I get this utility, electricity? I get it invisibly from the sky. And Ravi, water is next. I know it sounds crazy, but right now, you and I get our water from these centralized grids of pumps and pipes that it travels tens or hundreds of kilometers to reach our house. Guess where we're going to be getting our water in the not so distant future from the sky. And so I think I'll pause there and take any questions, but I can, this is a bit of quite a journey, quite a quest into the future of water. And I think it, it is that the future is this transition is the same one we just saw with two other utilities and it's now happening. It's not some futuristic thing in a Hollywood movie, it is already happening. So if you like, I'd be glad to go through examples of all four steps in the model, how people are harvesting, passively harvesting rainwater and dew and fog. Second, how they're doing these new, using these cool new technologies called atmospheric water generators and getting water at their property. And then once they have it, I've documented dozens of examples around the world where they're reusing it over and over again through gray water and black water recycling. Yeah, actually, I would love to double click into those four, into the four verticals that you talked about, because the biggest question I have in my mind is, I know what solar panels look like, we know what the cell phone towers look like, and what our iPhones look like, but what is the space required? If we have to have these really big things, and are they floating up multiple hundreds of feet in the sky to have enough surface area to collect all the moisture? Do the areas with fog, like Monterey, get much more access to more water than does somebody in Phoenix when it's where it's 117 degrees right now. And maybe there's not that much moisture. So yeah, there are a few questions, but uh, let's, let's definitely hop into the four sections and then maybe I'll interrupt you as we kind of go into that. Yeah, sure. That sounds great. Let's okay. Of the four ways of the four components of this vision for the future of on-site distributed water, let's talk about, let's talk about passive harvesting of sky water first. That's going to be fog, dew, and rain. And then we'll do active harvesting of water at your individual property, which will be the atmospheric water generators. So when it comes to passive water harvesting, obviously rainwater harvesting has been around for millennia. All you need, if you have roof space, you can harvest rainwater. And so people in the poorest villages in the world have been doing this for decades. People all over the world for centuries have been doing this. So you simply, you can do a very simple version where you have, you just catch the water coming off your roof and store it in a barrel, if you like, and use it for outdoor irrigation or whatever purpose. If you, there are more sophisticated models now where people are harvesting this in a more systematic way. If you like, if you don't have everybody, so it makes like solar panels, it makes use of your existing roof space. That roof wasn't doing a whole lot for you besides protect what's underneath it. And now it's your source of electricity. It's your little power plant on my house and millions of others. And it's also a source of water when you capture the water, the rainwater off of that roof. If you don't have the room down below for a lot of storage tanks, what we see increasingly is people bury the tank underground. There are examples, dozens and dozens of examples here in the Monterey Bay, for example, and up and down California, where people have buried these tanks, whether it's 10, 20, 30, 40,000 gallons worth of water storage tanks underwater, that saves space. It doubles the cost per gallon of storage, to, but you can do it. I'm thinking of an example in Monterey where I live. The, there's a Department of Defense facility up the hill at the Presidio, the D- Department of Defense Language Institute. They built a new six-story classroom. I went up there and looked at that six-story classroom because they're harvesting the water, the rainwater off the roof and putting it in an underground 20,000-gallon storage tank and u- using that rainwater to meet the needs of that six-story classroom for flushing toilets and other gray water purposes. So rainwater is rainwater is a technology that's becoming increasingly popular around the world. The big thing, the biggest challenge with rainwater harvesting right now 
is we really need, and this is an opportunity for an entrepreneur, is a financing play. What I've noticed is when new technologies, world-changing technologies come along, only the affluent people can afford them. When the first cars came along, only the rich had the cars. And then this thing came along called a car loan or an auto loan, and adoption went to the masses. Co going to college or university was something only the affluent could afford. And then came something called a student loan. Buying a house was something only the rich people could afford. And then came something called a home loan or a mortgage. What across the board, and then solar panels are another example. We, if you, somebody says, would you like to go solar? It's going to cost $20, $25,000 to get off the grid. And the payback periods are going to be like seven to 10 years. You're like, that's great, but I don't have that kind of money sitting around. Once we offered financing for solar adoption skyrocketed. I'm pretty sure it's going to be a similar story with rainwater harvesting. To buy the system, let's say it costs fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 for a building. If you don't have that money lying around, somebody needs to provide a loan where the 300 or so certified rainwater harvesting system designers, installers across the country can just design your system for you, show it to you, and you say, I'd love it, but I don't have $20,000. They'll say, hang on, you apply for a loan. In two minutes, you get an answer. They get your loan approved in two minutes right there on site. Right now, from the rainwater harvester and design designers and installers I've talked to, their close rate for customers is only one in five, twenty percent, because of the stick okay. because of the sticker shock. And they've told me that if they could offer financing, their close rate on rainwater harvesting system designs would spike fourfold. Instead of 20%, they can close 80% of the deals if they had financing. This could blow the lid off of the adoption of rainwater harvesting. So that's one, rainwater is, is there, think there's the way to potentially do a sort of like net metering. I know we're not going to probably put water back into the water supply lines, but is there an innovative financing model where they actually the rainwater installers can take a percentage of the net difference in cost that you would be paying with their system given what you're paying to like the utility bill? Possibly. Yeah, I think there is some, there's opportunity for creative business models here with rainwater harvesting and other sustainable water technologies for sure. Net metering, yeah. net metering is not going to work, unfortunately, because right now with the electricity, the solar panels on my roof are producing more electricity than I'm using. So it's pushing that excess back into the grid and I get credit for that financial credit. With water, it's impossible to do that. This vision for the future of water where we're producing water on site at our individual properties is a little different in that for public health concerns, you can't push that water back through the pipe into the grid because it's too risky. I see. Okay. And second, sure. there's too much pressure. The centralized distribution system of water coming through those pipes, there's a lot of pressure coming into your property, your household, and you won't have enough pressure to push that water back into the grid. So for those two reasons, the net metering thing has limited appeal. I'll mention one more thing about rainwater harvesting, then we can move on to some of the others, maybe fog. Yeah. Uh, another advantage is we're seeing the increasing effects of catastrophic wildfires. And on the long list of advantages of rainwater harvesting, having 10, 20,000 gallons of water sitting available at your property 24 seven, what we're seeing is that comes in really handy, not just during droughts and water rationing and disrupt disruption of water supplies, but especially during firefighting, when the fire crew rolls up to a property in our semi-rural or rural area or something on the urban interface on the edge of the city, they can dip their hose right into that 10,000 gallon tank and have a ready-made supply of water to protect your house. Whereas the homes that don't have that, that are going to struggle to have enough water, they'll drain the fire trucks tank pretty quickly and they'll sure. need more yeah. water and you've got it on site with rainwater harvesting tanks. So that's and, rainwater and kind of harvesting. Technically, what do these, what are the, what are the rainwater harvesting systems like look like in theory? I think I've seen a few of them in Monterey, but just for the audience out there, can you describe, are they just basically little, do they sit on your gutters so they capture the water and they bring them down or what's, yeah. what do they look like? Yeah. So a rainwater harvesting system is super simple. Right now, most buildings have a system of gutters. They collect the water in gutters that comes off the roof. And then that leads to a downspout that comes down along one corner of the property, maybe. And with rainwater harvesting system, you just splice into that downspout near the top and put a little valve there and you divert it. So instead of going down into the ground 
or into the street or down into a French drain underground. You divert that water with a switch whenever you want, and it goes down to a different pipe into the top of a 5,000-gallon tank or a 10,000-gallon tank. Or you can have a series of tanks connected by pipes. When you top off your 5,000-gallon tank, the overflow automatically goes to the next tank. When that one fills, it automatically starts filling the next tank and so on. And you can draw from them in reverse from the bottom. You drain one tank, it automatically starts pulling from the other tank. So it's a very simple system. The issue is storage, frankly. In the Western United States, we get a fair amount of rain. We have roughly in California, coastal California, where I live, we get about six months of kind of the wet green season and about six months of the dry season with no rain. And once the rains show up in October and November and continue on into December, January, February, and March, you want to be filling up tanks and store those to get you through the six months of dry season. So it requires a lot of storage capacity compared to places, other places in the United States and beyond where they get rain in the summer. It rains in it's the tornado season in May and you get a lot of storms in June and July and August and so on. So you could have a smaller tank, let's say a five or 10,000 gallon tank. You draw it down and it refills with the rain on an intermittent basis throughout the year. But here in California and many Western states, you need more tanks, more storage to stockpile that water to get you through the long, dry summer. And so d just so I understand the magnitude of what's happening in roughly in California, if you're looking for, and for, for the audience as well, how many gallons do we use on average in a given month or in a given six month season? And the second question is how much supply regularly on, on average would you get from a rainwater catchment system that's on a regular suburban home? Yeah, thanks for the question about quantity of rain that you can harvest potentially and how much water the typical household uses. Household water use varies across the country and by, by user type. But a typical household, let's say four people in the, in Calif coastal California you, is pretty water efficient, pretty conservation minded with their water. We can check the numbers later, but just a ballpark figure might be for you or me or somebody else in California, probably between 100 and 150 gallons per person per day. And so then you can, there are calculators online, just like there are calculators online for just about everything. You can use the rainwater harvesting calculators and it says, hey, what's the square footage of your roof area? And so you enter, Got okay, it. it's yeah. 20 feet by 20 feet by 60 feet. What's your zip code? So we can calculate how much rain you get per year. And you enter your zip code, calculates how much rain you're going to get per year. That's your harvestable quantity of water. And then you could divide that by the number of people in your household who are using 100, 120 gallons per day and come up with how, what your supply is. And the calculator will break it down for you. All right, you're going to run low, a little bit low in June, and then you'll top it off again. You'll run a little low in July and so on when you have to feed from the grid to supplement. Got it, got it. And roughly speaking, there is enough rain that's coming even from this in, in this phase one system to be able to support, on average, a family of four living in California. Yes. If you could harvest it, if you could harvest every drop, you're going to be good to go. Yeah. It depends on your roof size. And if you don't have a big enough roof, people are getting creative with where else they, where else they harvest <laughs> the rain. Awesome. Yeah. So let's, let's move to the atmospheric generators now. How, do, how does that work? How does it work to capture fog or any sort of other ambient types of okay, water? Okay, the... sure. So the first part of this four-part model for the future of water is passive water harvesting from the sky with fog, rain, and dew. We've talked about rain. Let's talk about fog a little bit. Fog is the technology for fog harvesting, unfortunately, has been stuck for about 50 years. You look at the modern, the most sophisticated technology available today for fog harvesting that people are using in, gosh, last time I checked, probably 20 countries around the world. It looks like something out of the 70s. It's like these volleyball nets strung up on a hillside, a ridge. They're collecting the fog that comes in off the ocean or wherever else. And these volleyball nets, it's actually agricultural shade cloth that they use. The droplets hit the shade cloth. They stick on there. Eventually, they can dent, they get heavier and thicker. They gravity feed down to the bottom. There's a trough at the bottom of the net that captures it, and gravity feeds that to a cistern. And then they fill up that tank, and then they gravity feed that to the community or the properties below. And so this is being used for decades in many places in the world. 
in some communities in Chile, Peru, and other areas, it's enough to supply the water needs for an entire community, including for agricultural purposes. And so people are harvesting fog in California, for example, there's a lot of this going on. One of the world experts in fog harvesting is right here in Monterey Bay, in fact, who has worked on the cutting edge of technologies for fog harvesting. But despite this, it's still, it's, I don't know, think of a technology like the 1970s, I don't know, like cassette tapes or something. That's where we are, it's fog harvesting. And so some of my students and I were like, this is ridiculous. Everything, every aspect of our life has evolved in the last decades, the technologies for phones and the technologies for cars and transportation and everything else. How come we're stuck 50, if 50 years with fog harvesting? Can we do something about this? So three of my students in Monterey and I, we designed something that I called the fog log. And the fog log was an attempt to bring fog harvesting into the 21st century. What we did, we take a, a cylinder, like a tube, about a meter long, about this wide, meter long, and we grabbed a couple of fans from laptops. Laptops have fans that are really quiet and have low energy use and don't overheat. We put a fan on one end of the tube to pull water in, and we put a computer laptop fan on the other end to suck water through. We got a sensor on it, a solar panel there on top, a little $30 solar panel. This is just our prototype a solar panel, and it has a sensor. When the fog comes in, the moisture sensor turns on the fan, and the fans start running, and they draw the fog in to a, into a proprietary filtration system inside that's a combination of hydrophilic and hydrophobic surfaces. The hydrophilic stuff attracts the water droplets and gets them to stick from the air and condense and get bigger and bigger. And then the hydrophobic aspect of the surface gets those water droplets to shed and drop towards the bottom of the cylinder. And then from there, they go through an outlet hole and they gravity feed through a tube into a container, a five-gallon container. So we worked on this prototype of the fog log. And the idea is, once we got that where we wanted it, where it was very efficient and cost-effective to harvest fog water using solar energy and a moisture sensor and this system that we developed inside to capture the water, water the idea would be to expand that to large tubes that are hidden under the mm. eaves of every residential and commercial building in California. I put one on my house and I painted it to blend in with the color of my house, use the same color paint. It's a tube, I don't know, maybe 12 inches in diameter, maybe 12, three meters long that hangs under the eave of my house, hidden with the solar panel, with the water sensor. When the fog comes in at night, day, whenever, turns on the fans on either end, pulls actively pulls the fog in, grabs that fog water, turns it into liquid, and fills up a tank down below. So the vision for fog harvesting is every building in California and other foggy coastal areas will be able to, instead of Mother Nature, the beauty about fog water, fog as a water source, is that it's Mother Nature provides water when and where you need it most. Take California, for example. Our driest months are the summer when people, we have water restrictions. We have water cops pulling, the, patrolling the streets, telling you don't water your lawn and so on. And Mother yeah. Nature's, oh, okay. How about I give you trillions of gallons of water every day, coastal California, when you need it most and where you need it most. And we've been for decades, we've been like, no, we don't want your gift. No, thank you. And now it's time we accept that gift. We say, you're going to give us trillions of gallons of water every day when and where we need it most for free? Okay, we'll accept that gift. Thank you. And so fog harvesting technology desperately needs to come into the 21st century. It's got a lot of potential, not just in the Western United States, but in literally dozens of countries that have very heavy fog. Fog harvesting. Wow, that is ingenious, Professor Langers. I, I love that, especially in the fact that you don't have these big, like you said, you have these big nets that were hanging there before. You've turned something that can be aesthetically hidden. That's the biggest thing is people's, people don't want these big things hanging on their homes. They want something they can stick underneath their eaves, which completely makes sense. Exactly. So I've done the math. In order to meet the water needs for my four-person household using the old 1970s approach, these nets for fog harvesting, I would have to cover every inch of my outdoor space with these nets. It's just not practical. Now, the way to solve this, the only way to, the best way to solve this would be to be able to make pickleball nets that harvest water, fog water. And that, that would do it right there because pickleball nets are going up all across the world right now. 
and that would do the trick potentially. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So far we've covered of our four four parts for the vision, the model for the future of decentralized on-site water. We've just got one more passive system and that's the dew harvesting. People are harvesting dew. The water, the water, the air cool, condens- cools at night and condenses the atmospheric water into drops. Instead of just those soaking in the ground, you can collect those and steer them with channels towards the base of your lettuce plants or your wine grapes or whatever it happens to be. So that's sure. the first part is passive harvesting of sky water, fog, dew, and rain. There's a lot of potential there. The second part of this is the really gee whiz technology aspect, and that is atmospheric water generators. And if you're not familiar with atmospheric water generators, these are machines that actively pull this invisible sky water from thin air and turn it into potable water. These are, I've been tracking these for years now. Last time I checked, there are probably at least three dozen companies around the world that are doing this. And I can send you some links. We can put them in the show notes, links to some of my favorite companies that are on the absolute cutting edge. You watch their videos, their their hype videos on their website, two minute videos, and you're like, oh my God, these are, this is an indigenous Navajo community in Arizona that has no water. And now they're getting pure drinking water from the sky. Oh my goodness. This is a poor community. People of color living in inner city when our water is contaminated and now they're getting water from the sky through these atmospheric water generators. Oh my goodness. This is a school in Africa where the kids are trying to learn, but they don't have water. And the girls have to spend hours every day going to get water and bring it back to their households and so on. And now they've got atmospheric water generators and they're producing potable drinking water invisibly from the sky and so on. These are, oh my God, this is a, there's been a natural disaster in Puerto Rico or Haiti. And instead of flying cargo planes full of bottled water, which is a financial and ecological catastrophe to do the emergency relief operations, We bring in the atmospheric water generators, the large commercial units, put them on site and produce drinking water from thin air right there on site at the disaster location. Even the military is using these now. U.S. military operations in Afghanistan and Iraq, every U.S. soldier is supposed to have a certain number of amount of water, certain liters per day per soldier. Instead of flying cargo planes full of bottled water to those theater operations, now you just, the military produce mounts an atmospheric water generator on the back of a truck and produces pure drinking water for the soldiers if from thin air on site. And the beautiful thing is we could talk about the technology. We could look at some videos and talk about these. But what I like about these atmospheric water generators is that increasingly they are solar powered. So they're truly off the grid. And in dry areas like a desert in Arizona, for example, they still work because Although the ambient moisture level is lower, there's not as much invisible water in the air, in the desert. You have virtually unlimited solar capacity. And so you can produce enough energy to run those machines longer and generate the, meet the water requirements of the local community. Whereas in moist areas where the ambient water level, let's say it's 70% humidity out, they work a lot more efficiently there and require less energy. Well, we should look at some videos, Robbie. We'll put them in the show notes. These are going to blow your mind, these atmospheric water generators. Can I just mention the one that I'm excited about? I'm not being sponsored by this company, but they've got the best investors in Silicon Valley. They're like the darling of Silicon Valley top investors, and Bill Gates is investing in them and so many others. I just ordered their latest unit. It's on back order. It's going to come to my house in October. And what I love about it is it's a solar panel. looks like a typical solar panel. It's mounted at a 45-degree angle. Typical solar panel, let's say two meters long, maybe a meter tall. And it's, that's the electricity. And it uses that electricity to run a little atmospheric water generator that produces pulls invisible sky water and then store, cleans it up and stores it right there for your use. So people are connecting these panels, just like you might have an array of 20 solar panels. I have 20 on my roof right now and they're all connected. They're not individuals. Same thing. You could have 20 of these hydro panels and the hydro panel is a solar panel that produces water you can have 20 of those connected so it's like legos you can connect them and disconnect them infinitely expandable depending on how much water you need and so these can produce water now and the price is coming down oh my goodness you think about the technology adoption curve here and the price think about the price of technologies and moore's law and so on and the plummet in the price of solar 
panels, how it's just dropped and dropped and become affordable at the payback period. Now these atmospheric water generators are on a similar curve. The adoption curve, the, the price is just coming down and down. Right now, last time I checked, it, it passed the price of bottled water. It's cheaper than bottled water, but it's still more expensive. Oh my God. Th- it's still more expensive than a lot of urban current price for regular water. Current price water, yeah. What's yeah. the company's name you said? Yeah, you can decide if you want to keep this in there or not. But if I could recommend your listeners to check out two websites, one of them would be, one of them would be a leading company called WaterGen, WaterGen, G-E-N dot com, WaterGen. Okay. Another one would be my favorite one. It's based here in the United States in Tucson. That, and the one that's now the darling of the Silicon Valley investors. That one is called Source, and I believe their website is Source. Source okay. Source dot co. Check out their websites. Cool. Check I would out actually, their hype videos. I'd love, to, I'd love to actually get them on the pod. I think it'd be great to have Ooh. somebody from Source be on. Yeah, the glasses somebody podcast. from Source would be fantastic. Those are two examples. Yeah. Again, Ravi, I track these. I'm the geek. I'm the geek who keeps an eye on this space, and I could give you a lot more examples of these things. They're doing incredible work. It is the future. This is, and right now people look at this and they say that's the most ridiculous thing. Harvesting water from the sky. That's ridiculous. And it reminds me of that. It reminds me of that saying by, by John Stuart Mill that back in the 1800s, every great movement must experience three stages, ridicule, discussion, and adoption. And right now, when it comes to water harvesting invisible water from the sky, at individual properties around the world and then reusing it forever over and over again, that sounds ridiculous. We are soon entering, starting with this podcast, the discussion stage. And we will go from ridicule to discussion to adoption. And it's the same thing. It reminds me of what happened with cell phones. The first cell phone in 1983, if you look at pictures of the first cell phone in 1983, it was was the size of a brick. It weighed several pounds. It only did one thing, and that was make phone calls. And it didn't even do that very well. And you can only talk to very few (laughs) other people who had this crazy thing. And guess what? Guess what the price was? About $4,000. And so back to that John Stuart Mill quote, every great movement must experience three stages, ridicule, discussion, and adoption. That first cell phone was ridiculous. Who on earth is going to buy that thing? $4,000 for a brick that hardly does anything. And then it went through discussion. And we know the adoption story there. Ravi, the same thing is about to happen with sky water. I love that. That's amazing. So I'll, I'll, we'll definitely put those those notes in the uh, in the YouTube and on the blog, water gen and source water. What is next? What happens after we take the, uh, the right. passive and the active water? Okay. So again, the vision for the future of water, which is closer and better than you think, is that we're going we're gonna to mitigate a lot of the current environmental, ecological, and social challenges with water by harvesting water straight from the sky at individual properties and then recycling it forever. So far, we've talked about the first part of that, which is harvesting water straight from the sky, passively through fog, dew, and rainwater harvesting, and then actively through these newfangled devices, the atmospheric water generators. Once you've got the water, an unlimited water supply at your property, you want to reuse those same gallons forever through gray water recycling and black water recycling. And I'll just preface this by saying, this is a little embarrassing, but I'm old enough to remember when recycling cans and paper and plastic was not common. When I was young, a long time ago, back when the Earth's crust was still cooling, it seems, we did not recycle that stuff. <laughs> but now my kids look at me like, man, is you're old. Is it true that when you were a kid, you would use a can or a bottle once and then throw it away? And I'm like, yeah, I know it's embarrassing. Ravi, I'm here to tell you that the kids, the grandkids, of today, they're going to look back on you and me and they're going to say, is it true that in 2023, Ravi and Jeff, you would use a gallon of water one time and then throw it away? And we're going to be like, yeah, yeah, it's embarrassing. I know, but that's what's going to happen. We are about to start recycling water on a massive scale. The first technology for that is gray water harvesting. There are a lot of technologies out there for gray water harvesting. The most basic systems, for example, there's a law here in California that everybody can do what's called laundry to landscape, gray water recycling. I did it as well. My clothes washer, my clothes, we wash, when we use our clothes washer at our house, it used to be those gallons would just go right down the drain, never to be used again. 
And now we've diverted that water out into our yard and we use it for landscaping, for drip landscaping. And we have a beautiful green lawn with flowers thanks to just capturing our laundry water. And several years ago, California state legislature and the governor passed a law that said, you don't even need to get permit from your county governments to do this. Everybody can do this. Please do. And so we did that. Our local water company provided all the technology we needed. Just takes about a hundred dollars worth of gear that you can get at Home Depot and you can watch some YouTube videos and do it. And so I'm not all that handy, but I was able to start recycling my gray water from my clothes washer. So gray water is water that's not very dirty. It comes from your clothes washer. It comes from your, your bathtub and your shower and other sources where it's not too nasty. And it doesn't require a certain level of cleanliness. And you can reuse it fairly easily, outdoors especially. There are gray water recycling units for every size. There are small household ones and there are large commercial ones. One of the students in Monterey and I, we started a gray water recycling company and we, we got venture back, angel investors, venture backing. And we started installing gray water recycling systems at commercial properties between San Francisco and Los Angeles. And we signed these customers up on 20 year contracts. And those contracts represented millions of dollars in savings for each of our customers off their water bills, especially when you play out 20 years of ongoing price increases and the water rates. Those contracts represented millions of dollars of revenue for our company. And more importantly, they yeah. represented millions of gallons of water recycled that otherwise would have gone down the drain. I'll just say one oh, more yeah, thing about gray water yeah. recycling. And that is well, maybe a couple of things, but one of the big advantages of gray water recycling is when you're in urban areas where the cost of water is high and they're not only metering how many gallons that come into your property, but also the wastewater that goes out increasingly on meters. Sure. So in a city like San Francisco, for example, let's say you pay two cents a gallon to get water into your property and two cents a gallon to get rid of it. That's four cents. You can install a gray water recycling system for between one and two cents per gallon. Suddenly, you're instantly saving off your next water bill over 50%. So the payback period can be very fast on this, especially if you're in an urban area where you're on metered water. That's gray water recycling. It's wide open right now. There are so many incredible buildings that are building wonderful gray water recycling systems. And that leads me to the next topic, the fourth part of this model for on-site distributed water production, where you harvest it on-site and then you keep using it forever. And that is the black water recycling. Black water is simply water that's got bacteria in it. It comes from your kitchen sink. It comes from your toilets. It's water that requires extra effort to clean up. And so black water recycling technology is coming on very quickly these days. One of the early proponents was Bill Gates. Microsoft, if you Google around, you can find an example of he was an early investor in a machine that would take sewage, raw sewage and in 10 minutes, clean it up to a glass of water. And you can find the pictures of Bill Gates drinking water that was raw sewage 10 minutes earlier. The technologies have mm. come on. They're doing this, obviously, at municipal wastewater treatment facilities up and down the coast of California and around the world, Singapore especially. They're cleaning up that wastewater and reusing it at the municipal level. But at the individual property level, for residential and commercial, people are increasingly doing this as well. It's especially common in large commercial buildings now. In San Francisco, for example, the number of buildings that are now doing gray water and black water recycling is really growing quickly. Think about when you look at the skyline of San Francisco, the tallest building that towers above others is the Salesforce Tower. It opened in January in 2000. Yeah. Salesforce Tower. One of the things I love about the Salesforce Tower, this tall, tallest building in the San Francisco skyline, is that when it opened in January 2018, it opened with a 30,000 gallon a day black water recycling system in the basement. And so every day, the people up at all the floors of that tower flush the toilets, use the kitchen sinks, and so on. Every day, all those gallons get captured and recycled and up and cleaned up to potable level and reuse the next day and the next day and the next day over and over again. And the number of buildings that are now using black water recycling system just keeps going up and up. So it's just phenomenal. So there you have it, Robbie. Wow. There's the model. There's the vision 
for on-site distributed water. We're going to overcome these currently sustain current sustainability challenges or mitigate them by harvesting water straight from the sky and then reusing it over and over again at individual properties. It's a distributed system. We're going to harvest it through passive means, rainwater, har- dew, and fog harvesting, active means, these atmospheric water generators. And then once you have that water on your property, you just keep using it over and over again. And I'll just say one more thing, and that is what I've described here fits into this large, when we zoom back, we look at the larger span of how humans have interacted with water. I break humanity's approach to water into three stages. The first stage was, I call it, go get it. And that was the cavemen days, the prehistoric time. If you wanted water and you were a cave person, you had to go to a stream, go to a river, go to a lake, and get the water and get a drink. And then we entered, humanity entered a stage two that I call bring it back. And the bring it back stage started with the Roman aqueducts and other aqueducts. Are, and we're still in this stage. We bring water to San Francisco from Hetch Hetchy. We bring water to Los Angeles from the Eastern Sierras in the Owens Valley. We pipe it two, 300 kilometers. We go get it and then we bring it back through aqueducts and so on. So right now, humanity is in stage two, bring it back. But we're about to enter stage three with how humanity does water. And I call stage three, let it come. And we're just going to, instead of going to get the water, instead of bringing it back, you're going to stay home and let it come to you. And this has precedent. I like to joke that we've seen this movie before, literally with Hollywood movies. Think about, again, I'm dating myself, but when I was young, the only way to go see a movie was to go get it. You had to go to something called a movie theater if you wanted to see a movie. And then we entered a stage called bring it back stage two where you go to some up store it used to be called blockbuster and they would rent these things called mm-hmm. dvds i don't know if you're familiar with a dvd you'd rent them at this company called blockbuster so just like you would go get it and then we entered stage two which is bring it back you bring that movie back to your house just like stage two of water we bring it back to our house and then we entered stage three instead of go get the movie at the movie theater which our movie theaters are closing down by the thousands over the last decade or bring it back from Blockbuster, and Blockbuster is closed down. Now, instead, we let it come. We stream it right into your house through what companies, what, what's the new technology we use? Through Netflix. Netflix, Netflix Hulu, Hulu, Disney, Plus. Disney yeah. Plus, DVD, and so on. So basically, the world, everything's getting flat. And this is one of the great, tra- the great stories of our era, our lifetime, is how things are getting flatter. We're moving to from these top-down centralized distribution models to the decentralized distributed approach. It's movies. Think about if you wanted to hop or catch a ride, you're visiting a city, New York City, you want to catch a ride to the airport or across town, you used to have to use these centralized taxi systems you call a yellow cab or a red cab. Now it's Uber yeah. and Lyft. If you wanted, if you were visiting a city and you wanted to stay someplace, get some lodging for the night, you used to use these centralized big hotel chains like Hilton and so on. Now we have this distributed grassroots model with Airbnb and VRB. Same thing with currencies. The only currency forever has been centralized currencies issued by the Central Bank of England, the Central Bank of Rwanda. And now we have the distributed decentralized currencies as well in the form of Bitcoin. This is one of the great transitions of our lifetime, and it's happening with water Next, one of my favorite books of all time was written by Thomas Friedman called The World is Flat. And it's a brief history of the 21st century, talking about how things are getting flatter and flatter, decentralized, distributed systems. Thomas Friedman wrote that book in 2007. Here we are more than a decade later. And I would say the world is not only flat, but it's getting flatter every minute. And now it's happening with water. We're moving towards a flatter, distributed grassroots approach to water, just like we've done with movies and transportation and telecommunications and electricity and so many other things. Professor Langholz, that is absolutely amazing. I thought that was, and you stole the question out of my last question of what book would you recommend? And (laughs) The World is Flat by Thomas Friedman, 100%. We'll have to throw that in the show notes as well. But thank you so much. I'd love to actually grab the diagram. I think we should put it on either the YouTube video or potentially the blog. 
I think it'd be great to actually circulate that around and create a little asset out of it. But uh, thanks again for coming on the pod. I mean, my pleasure. All the best. And for all of those of you out there, if you want to listen to Liquid Assets, you can find us at liquidassets.cc or anywhere else you get your podcasts or on YouTube today.